tình họa sĩ là chiến sĩ là những hiểu lắm và các chị rất cảm ơn Thank you uh, kindly for the invitation to speak at this important national meeting. And thank you also for the honour of um, being uh, a part of the panel with Professor Ding Ngoc Si, uh, who was the leader of the Vietnam National Tuberculosis Program during a period of great success in tuberculosis control in Vietnam. And also uh, Dr Lan, who is leading uh, the tuberculosis control efforts uh, in Ho Chi Minh City, uh, which is a major uh, battleground in the fight against tuberculosis in Vietnam. So I'm honoured to be uh, joining them uh, on the panel today. Uh, Vietnam has indeed made a great um, progress in tuberculosis control over the last two decades and now is leading uh, the world in its commitment to try new approaches to tuberculosis control. Today I'm going to talk to you about the next uh, step in tuberculosis control, which is latent tuberculosis infection. I'm going to talk to you about what is our understanding of latent tuberculosis infection, how does that affect the way that we manage patients, and then at the end I'm going to talk about some research that is underway in partnership between the Vietnam National Tuberculosis Program and the University of Sydney and the Wilcock Institute to develop new strategies to prevent tuberculosis. I show you a slide here which summarizes our traditional understanding of the biology of tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, as you know, is an airborne disease and it's estimated that around one in 10 people who are infected by that bacteria will go on to develop tuberculosis in their lifetime. That means, based on recent estimates, that around 2 billion people in the world and around 20 to 30 million people in Vietnam have been infected by the tuberculosis bacteria. That reactivation may occur rapidly we think about a half of people progress within the first one to two years, but it can progress many years later. In Australia, there are about 200,000 Vietnamese-born Australians, and many of the patients in my tuberculosis clinic were born in Vietnam, and now they are 60 or 70 years old, and the tuberculosis comes back again when they are in an older age group as their body's immune system wanes. Their body has had the bacteria for, for their whole lifetimes. And it tells you how challenging tuberculosis is that we need to identify um, and be able to treat these people uh, even many years after the exposure. Tuberculosis and later tuberculosis infection have been traditionally thought of as two um, extremes. On the one hand, tuberculosis disease is symptomatic. People have a cough, they may lose weight, and they then are infectious to other people. In contrast, latent tuberculosis is not symptomatic. People feel completely well, and the only evidence that we have that they've been infected is a test, either a skin test or a blood test. This traditional idea meant that we thought that tuberculosis disease was only present in a small number of people and tuberculosis infection was present in a much larger number of people. In order to diagnose latent tuberculosis infection, uh, people can be tested using either a skin test, the MANTU test, which you can see here on a child in Ho Chi Minh City that's participating in uh, one of the studies, or they can use interferon gamma release assays. Interferon gamma release assay or quantiferon uses a blood test instead of a skin test and it uses a very specific antigen, um, either ESAT6 or CFP10, 
which is only present in Mycobacterium tuberculosis, but is not present in the BCG vaccine. The interferon gamma release assay is more specific, and there are two different types. Quantiferon, which is more widely known in Vietnam, and also the T-spot test, which is commonly used in the United Kingdom. Both of these two tests give us a blood test result for infection. The thing is, both of the interferon gamma release assay test and the tuberculin skin test only give us an indirect measure of infection. They can only tell you what's happened in the past. They don't tell you what your risk is in the future of going on to get tuberculosis. And so therefore, we know that um, uh, neither TST nor quantiferon test is better than the other. Either tests are equally effective in predicting the future risk of tuberculosis. As a result, WHO recommends that either tuberculin skin testing or interferon gamma release assay are both appropriate. There's no preference and there's no advantage. And in fact, in my own hospital in Australia, we mostly do tuberculin skin testing because it is a lower cost. And actually, when you show the patient that they have a skin test which is positive, they believe you that they need to take treatment. So in fact, the tuberculin skin test, I think, is still a very useful test, uh, which uh, is still valuable today and still we use in many uh, clinical settings. Now, I've just talked to you about the traditional understanding of latent tuberculosis infection. Nowadays, in the 21st century, we have a much more complex understanding. We don't any longer regard there to be only two states of latent tuberculosis infection and TB disease. In fact, it's now thought that there is a spectrum between the two ends. And in fact, patients can go back and forth between one end and the other, depending upon their body's immune system and other environmental factors. So for example, around 50% of people who get tuberculosis may self-cure. And then later on, months or years later, the disease may come back again. And what this means is that when we're looking for tuberculosis, it can be much more challenging than we first thought. I've got here an, uh, a slide from a, a recent review article published in 2018 by Drain et al, which indicates a new way of thinking about tuberculosis. And instead of proposing just two states, they propose five different states that uh, may occur in one person. So either a person can be infected and they can eliminate the infection, which you can see in the box here is um, what we call exposure. They may become infected, which means the bacteria is in their body but they feel very well. They may have incipient tuberculosis infection, which means that they have the bacteria that is replicating but they still feel healthy. They may have some clinical disease, which means that they may have an abnormal chest x-ray, but they still feel healthy, there's no symptoms, or they may have active tuberculosis disease. Now, in Vietnam and in most countries, the focus of the TB control program up to now has only been on this bottom group, only been on people who have symptoms of tuberculosis. The problem is that if we only look at that bottom group, then there are many people in the community who still have infectious um, disease that is subclinical, but we are not able to prevent them from transmitting it to other people. And so as a result, even if you have a perfect tuberculosis control program, there will still be many people in the community who continue to transmit the infection. And in fact, there's evidence now from Southeast Asia which shows that this is actually a major part of the TB epidemic. Twelve national prevalence surveys from in Asia have shown that this subclinical tuberculosis state is actually very common. So for example, in Pakistan, 40% um, of tuberculosis was subclinical. In Myanmar, almost 80% of prevalent tuberculosis was asymptomatic. In Vietnam, the National Prevalence Survey found around 
of tuberculosis did not have the typical symptoms of TB, even though there was a positive culture when they were tested. So these data suggest to you that in fact, subclinical tuberculosis is a very major cause of transmission of tuberculosis. And in fact, um, therefore, we need to be looking much more at how we can find those people and bring them to us rather than waiting for them to get sick and coming into the tuberculosis program. This review article identified that there's a number of risk factors that people have that make them likely to have subclinical tuberculosis. This includes a past history of TB, HIV positivity, pregnancy, chronic disease such as diabetes or chronic kidney disease, household contact with a tuberculosis patient, being a minor, and being a prisoner. All of those groups have high rates of subclinical tuberculosis. The question is, well, what happens to those patients? And we know that in national prevalence surveys, such as in Vietnam, that the duration that people have this disease is probably at least as long as they have symptoms when they come into the TB program. In some cases, they may have this disease and then it may progress rapidly, but in other cases, they may remain infectious for months or even years before they're detected. There's a notion from some studies in South Africa, which is the notion of a super spreader, that is, there's probably a small number of people who live in the community who are very, uh, who are asymptomatic, who have maybe a slight cough, but are very infectious, and so they may actually be responsible for a lot of the transmission. But if we don't do active case finding, then we won't find them and we won't be able to prevent the transmission. And so it's thought, therefore, that this subclinical state is responsible for a lot of the undetected transmission, and that it's likely to be missed by the passive case finding approaches that we have. And so, as a result, the question then becomes, well, how can we find these people? There is a range of different alternative strategies. I'm going to talk about some of them today. There are some new tools which have become available that allow us to get a much better idea about this subclinical group. There was a paper published uh, in The Lancet uh, two years ago by Zach et al., which found that there was a blood test that could be done using uh, 16 gene RNA signature that could identify people who had progressed to tuberculosis up to 18 months before they actually became sick. So that is, there was a measurable change in the people more than a year before they went on to develop tuberculosis. So the question is, can we develop methods of detecting these people very early and predicting who's going to get tuberculosis? There's a study which is now underway called the Quarter Study, which is using the results of that study from Southern Africa and saying, if we treat those people who have this abnormal signature, will that be more effective or more efficient at preventing tuberculosis? And we maybe will have more specific tests in the future that will allow us to go and target treatment much earlier to this patient group. So this brings me on then to the question of latent tuberculosis in Vietnam. We know that uh, worldwide that uh, most of the tuberculosis is in the Southeast Asian region, and that uh, if you look in the figure here from the recent WHO report, that uh, Vietnam is one of the top uh, countries for incident tuberculosis. Uh, in fact, um, a global estimate found that 23% of the entire world's population have latent tuberculosis infection, and that in the Western Pacific region of WHO, it's even higher, around 28%. Um, we've recently published a study from Khao Mao province in Vietnam which measured the prevalence of latent tuberculosis in the general population of Vietnam. And we found an even higher rate. Um, we conducted a cross-sectional survey um, in Vietnam, uh, in this province of Khao Mao in the south, using quantiferon gold. You remember I said that quantiferon gold is a very specific test. And so this is um, uh, a true indication of the burden of, of latent TB. And we found that in that general population sample in adults, that 36.8%, or over one third of the population, had latent tuberculosis infection. And that the, the prevalence in males was about 50% higher than the prevalence in females. So what this tells you is that in Vietnam, in the general community, 
uh, this group of latent tuberculosis infection is likely to be a very major cause of the ongoing TB epidemic in Vietnam. We also know that high risk groups uh, such as household contacts are also very likely to have latent tuberculosis infection. This meta-analysis that we performed a number of years ago found that amongst close contacts of patients with tuberculosis, that about half of the uh, contacts of smear positive TB had latent tuberculosis infection. So this means that this group particularly is a very efficient group to target if we want to prevent tuberculosis. Now, um, my esteemed colleague uh, has just explained to you the importance of us finding new strategies to reduce the rate of tuberculosis in order to achieve the NTB strategy targets. Now, it is not going to be possible to eliminate tuberculosis or even to go and reach the um, short-term targets unless we try new strategies. Now, traditional passive case finding strategies, which is what Vietnam does, wait until people come to, to the clinic with symptoms, is clearly not going to be enough to eliminate tuberculosis. It's going to be necessary to go and do more things. And what we're doing in Vietnam, in partnership with the National Tuberculosis Program, is developing evidence to show that these additional interventions are effective and are feasible. I'm going to talk to you now about um, some active case finding studies that we've done, where we go out into high-risk populations and screen those populations for subclinical disease in order to reduce transmission. And we're also doing a number of studies to try and scale up the treatment of latent tuberculosis infection so we can stop people from getting TB in the first place. I'm going to go now to um, the uh, WHO guidelines, which I think are helpful in this regard. The WHO has, for the last five or six years, changed the emphasis of its recommendations for high prevalence countries such as Vietnam. It has moved away from this idea that we should only wait until people come to the clinics and now advocating a much more active approach to screening for tuberculosis. Since 2012, there's been strong recommendations from WHO that we should be screening high-risk populations such as household contacts. But until recently, there's not been evidence to show that that is effective. So with the National Tuberculosis Program, we conducted a randomised control trial to evaluate what is the effect of contact investigation upon the yield of tuberculosis in household contacts in Vietnam. And we conducted the ACT-2 study in eight provinces of Vietnam, looking at both feasibility and effectiveness of active case finding. The randomised trial randomised districts to either control group, which was standard of care, passive case finding, or intervention, which was screening using chest x-ray and sputum smear and culture um, for four episodes over two years. This is a summary of the algorithm which shows you that we screened household contacts of smear positive patients at baseline after six months, after 12 months and after 24 months. And each time if they had an abnormality on their chest x-ray or if they had symptoms of tuberculosis, then we collected three sputum samples and sent them for smear and culture. If we were doing the study again today, we would do expert instead of culture. But we used practical tests which were available in the clinics at the time. This is a map of Vietnam showing the extent of the study. It was conducted throughout rural and urban areas in the north, the centre and the south of the study. And particularly uh, in the south where there is a large number of patients, we had the most uh, people recruited. This study was an achievement of the National TB Program. Um, although the Wilcock Institute supported the implementation, the recruitment and follow-up of staff was performed by the National Tuberculosis Program. And so here's a picture of one of our research staff meeting with um, staff uh, in a district in uh, Ho Chi Minh City and uh, working with them uh, to, uh, to, to do in-service training about contact investigation. So you'll see here a summary of the results of this study um, that approximately 25,000 household contacts were recruited to this study. And between 2010 and 2015, we followed people up. And we found that 
the incidence of TB in the intervention groups, that is the number of cases we detected, was 2.5 times higher than we detected in the control group. That indicated that we detected two and a half times as many cases by doing active screening compared to standard practice. This indicates that there were a lot of cases in the control group that were not detected and they never came to, to seek care. Uh, and that meant two things. First of all, that the people who got tuberculosis were more likely to die or have bad health outcomes. And secondly, they were likely to continue transmitting disease. When we uh, looked at microbiologically confirmed TB, we found that there was a six times increase in the intervention group compared to the control group. And I think one of the most uh, exciting findings, which we were not expecting, was that this intervention was associated with a 40% reduction in mortality in the intervention group compared to the control group. And this was a post hoc analysis, and so it requires further um, evaluation. But it does indicate that active case finding not only is likely to be beneficial to the community by reducing transmission, but reduces mortality and improves case detection. So it suggests that in Vietnam and in settings like Vietnam, that active case finding is something which uh, is likely to be very effective. What's interesting in Vietnam is that, in fact, it was mostly in adults that child disease was very um, minimal. And we found that you had to screen about 75 people in order to detect an extra case of tuberculosis. Now, just briefly moving to the other studies that we're doing, I wanted to talk about the scale of screening for latent tuberculosis infection. This pie chart here indicates that a very small percentage of the world's latent TB infection is actually currently being treated. We know from randomised trials that were published almost 50 years ago and some other recent trials in the last um, year that uh, preventive therapy for latent TB can reduce the incidence by at least 70%. And so therefore the question is why aren't we doing this more? WHO recommends the use of preventative ther therapy for latent TB infection and a recent study from uh, Dick Menzies at McGill found that a four month course of rifampicin is as effective as a nine-month course of isoniazid in treating latent TB infection. There's also evidence that a three-month weekly course of isoniazid ripopentine is effective. The problem is that this is not being done very effectively. We're doing a study where we take this idea of cascade of care, where we take all the people who might be eligible and we see who could be treated if we were to follow up as many people as possible and offer them therapy. And we found from, well, Dick Menzies' group found from a, from a meta-analysis that even if you take 100 people who should be screened in a household, uh, only two-thirds ever get tested, and only half of those ever get referred, a very small percentage ever end up actually starting treatment. So only a third of people in international studies ever end up getting started on treatment, and only around half of those end up finishing treatment. That tells us that there's a big gap between what we could be achieving and what we actually are achieving. So the ACT4 study in Vietnam is aiming to test an intervention to increase participation in latent TB screening. It's a part of a study in five countries, which include Vietnam and the other countries that are listed there. And what we're doing is we're using a very simple intervention, education of patients and health workers, and uh, the offering of tuberculin skin testing uh, and latent tuberculosis therapy for household contacts of TB patients. This is being conducted in uh, the centre of Vietnam, in Quang Nam and Da Nang provinces. Preliminary results, I think, are very stark. On the left-hand side, you see what happened before the intervention, which is 0.6% of people received therapy. On the right-hand side, you can see what happened after the intervention. It increased to around 30%. And remember, only around 50% would have been TST positive. So a dramatic increase. And so this demonstrates that patients in Vietnam accept latent TB therapy. It demonstrates that we've increased by about 30 times, more than 30 times, the participation rate of LTBI therapy. And it demonstrates that um, in Vietnam, that this population is one which is very feasible to access through interventions. So I think this is a first step in scaling up LTBI therapy for Vietnam.
uh, with uh, a number of um, provinces in Vietnam, including uh, with Professor Lan in Ho Chi Minh City and with the National TB Program. We're also doing a study looking at contacts of um, people with multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. And we're looking at um, a randomized trial where we're testing the effectiveness of a fluoroquinolone and seeing whether that does help to reduce TB and LTB in contacts of multi-drug resistant patients. That study, which is still underway, is being conducted across Vietnam and will give us evidence that will tell us what we need to do for multi-drug resistant tuberculosis patients. And I think Vietnam should be very proud that this study is underway. It's one of three studies, including the Phoenix study in TB Champ, uh, which will provide evidence about how to treat contacts of multi-drug resistant TB who have latent TB infection. So just in conclusion, new strategies are needed to go and reduce the incidence of TB. Active case finding has to be a part of this, otherwise we won't find these patients with subclinical TB. Screening treatment for LTBI is feasible, including in Vietnam. We've shown that very clearly. And now the question is, who should we screen? So now the question is not, should we do LTBI treatment, but how many people can we treat? How can we scale it up? Which is where studies like the ACT4 study will come in to help guide policy translation into practice. So I'd like to acknowledge the National Tuberculosis Program um, and the many staff and patients who have participated in our study. And I'd like to also recognise the work of people from the University of Sydney and also in McGill who participated in this study. Thank you for your attention today.